so basically we are talking about the fundamentals of mental joining so uh, i'll tell you some of the very interesting things about uh, these joining approaches uh, especially the metal joining approaches uh, one about which uh, we you have already seen in his study that was uh, this one where uh, the components to be joined need to be fused so fusion is realized and uh, after the fusion uh, you get uh, the joint okay so this is one thing in another case what we do we uh, put the two metallic components firmly against each other under pressure so that they are there is a kind of plastic deformation and intermixing of the metal from the two sides takes place so now uh, basically the plastic deformation uh, coupled with the uh, mechanical interlocking you can say uh, this leads to the development of joint in this case things remain in the solid state this is one of the approach uh, here there may be little diffusion as well in in some of the cases and uh, the third approach here we get the liquid state here things remain in the solid state and there is one more approach of the met which is used for metallic joining there what we do between the two components we uh, the components remain in solid state like A and uh, the B but in between we put the third kind of the metal in liquid state. Uh, so this liquid metal is placed but there is no fusion of the two components A and B. That is why this is called solid and liquid both joining and your uh, the typical brazing or shouldering processes fall in this category only and here you have like in in your subject we have got in solid state only ultrasonic welding otherwise there are number of other processes like uh, diffusion bonding or the metallic magnetic pulse welding explosion welding those are other solid state joining process where um, the plastic deformation coupled with the mechanical interlocking and diffusion leads to the development of joint. In case of fusion, fusion again is of the two categories. One, in the fusion joining, we have to fuse the ends of the components or edges of the components to be uh, joined. But again, here we have the two uh, approaches. One, when very thin sheet of say 1 mm, 2 mm is to be joined. Then what we do? We apply the heat source, okay, and just to fuse the component. And after the solidification, you get the joint. This is called autogenous. When there is no other addition of the metal from outside, so you can say there is no addition of filler in this case. So all those processes where just the ends of the component to be joined are brought to the molten state by the application of heat followed by solidification leading to the development of joint. So these are called autogenous welding process or autogenous weld joints. There is no addition of filler. In this case, uh, the performance of the joint is solely governed by the type of metal which is being joined. Type of metal or the parent metal or base metal uh, which is being joined. Both terms are used, base metal or parent. Uh, it may be weaker or it may be harder. I will give example. If you take the steel seats, just fuse them together. Okay, Your weld will be much stronger than the base metal means the joint efficiency will be more than 100% failure certainly will not be occurring from the belt joint region because the joint is getting stronger after the solidification uh, because of the conditions which are being experienced during the welding in the weld zone. 
but if you take so this is an example of the steel but if you take an example of say aluminium magnesium those kind of things then you may notice this zone or even autogenous weld this zone is leading to the very weak joint and failure invariably occurs from the region close to the weld or from the weld zone itself so joint efficiency say 30 percent 40 percent 50 percent depending upon the process which is being used the joint is weaker so this is the story of like uh, the autogenous welding where just a fusion of the ends of the components is being realized and this is what we do using say laser beam welding for thin sheet joining or TIG welding, tungsten inert gas welding or the plasma arc welding. In all these cases, a uh, very high energy density is supplied so that the things uh, uh, melt with the very less amount of the heat. These are the two different things, energy density of the process or the heat which is to be supplied. These go in opposite manner, higher the energy density, lower the heat input need to be supplied for facilitating the fusion. I will come on this a little later. There is another type of the joining process where you have to add the filler metal, say you very thick seats are to be joined. Like say uh, these are 50 mm, 60 mm or even 20 mm thick seats. So they are single, uh, simply melting of the edges of the component will not help you to develop the joint, but you have to add the filler metal as well so some filler metal from outside has to be added and in this in this case you will have very wider weld joint but the the good part here is the filler addition is possible i'll elaborate why it is good and what are the other issues which are taken care of by this filler addition but whether it is autogenous welding or the filler uh, the welding with the addition of some kind of the filler metal in both the cases you get the uh, uh, you you uh, your base metal experiences the change in properties of the change in properties of the parent metal or base metal so this region where this change is being experienced is known as heat affected zone heat affected zone is very much integral part of any fusion welding or even in solid state also which may be smaller so the fusion welding will always have the HAZ HAZ is the zone where the properties have got modified due to the application of the heat okay so the filler so the fusion welding with filler or without filler this is the only kind of the uh, these the, are the two broad categories okay uh, in case of the plastic deformation or solid state joining what is most important thing since there is no fusion so whatever the surfaces are to be joined they must be clean before development of the joint so that there is no oil paint dust dirt grease oxides present at the surface otherwise these will be leading to the presence of the discontinuities at the joint interface and the metallic connectivity continuity will not be there across the joint so the cleanliness of the surfaces is crucial is very important in solid state joining whether it is ultrasonic explosive or magnetic foils or diffusion in all the cases it is very important that surfaces are made free from the impurities okay so this is this is uh, the broader approach of uh, the fusion as well as the uh, uh, the solid state joining let me talk little bit about the further details of uh, the uh, fusion joining okay so how about the performance of the fusion weld joint like this this is the weld and these are the components okay component a and a both are being joined and in between you have the weld zone where which has been developed using suitable filler metal okay so in this case when you apply the external load your weld can fail from the joint can fail from the weld region 
or from the region in vicinity of the world that is HAZ1 or HAZ2 from any side or from the base metal okay so uh, if he in, in in a situation where the filler metal is to be used for joining of uh, thick sections one thin sections are autogeneously welded that's possible or dissimilar metal weld of means metal a of one type and metal b of another type and if the two are to be joined then we have to bring in third kind of the metal in between which is compatible to both a and b so say a and b the two are not compatible with, B, with each other so what we do we add the c third type of the metal c which is compatible with both okay so this is the another role which is played by the filler metal filler metal helps to develop the weld joint fusion weld joint between the two dissimilar metals different type of the filler metal uh, sorry different type of the base metals which are not having good metallurgical or physical or mechanical compatibility with each other so so uh, one aspect is like in thick sections where direct through thickness penetration or melting is not possible so there you have to prepare the edges and then entire gap has to be filled in using suitable filler this is the logic so for welding of thick sections the fillers are to be used or for having the good compatibility you can say uh, the word i'll more appropriate is to use the metallurgical or you can say simply the compatibility for good compatibility between the different uh, dissimilar metals you can say dissimilar metals so if the joint is to be developed between the dissimilar metals then filler helps in, in a very good way in establishing the compatibility between the two different filler uh, different base metals and also to join the thick sections okay another good part is if you say the base metal is of 200 mpa both the sides now you can as per the application you may choose the filler of 100 mpa or 250 mpa strength so means the well joint properties you can alter as per your need if you need the weld of the better corrosion resistance better hardness better yield strength or the lower side as per the case so you can choose the filler metal accordingly so the weld joints will filler metal is possible to use like, like say joining of the uh, thick sections or joining of the, the dissimilar metals there you have at least an option to use the filler metal of your convenience so that the weld joint of the desired set of the properties can be developed but that is not so in case of the autogenous welding where it is very thin section and there is no opportunity to use the filler metal you have to just because sections are very thin you have to just fuse the ends so the properties here in are not in your hands that will depend upon the kind of uh, the base metal characteristics itself which is being welded you don't get opportunity to alter the properties okay so this is one uh, thing related with the 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 welding with filler metal okay now uh, another aspect about which as i said the heat affected zone you know in a fusion welding the heat affected zone can be very narrow say it can be just of say 2 or 5 m mm uh, in width means that is away from the fusion boundary this is fusion boundary so up to 5 mm the properties are getting modified leading to the development of the hz when the heat input is low when the heat input is high this width can be as high as 15 mm you know so the weakness modification in properties can be up to the wider zone so this will be weakening the joint to a greater extent so uh, the heat input is another critical aspect in welding in general 
the what happens when you supply the heat say when you are supplying the heat at the rate for developing the weld of per unit length like say this way so if you are supplying the heat of 2 kilojoule per mm your weld is say of this kind if you supply the heat of 5 kilojoule per mm you will get the weld much wider much larger cross section like this so there is a great difference if you see the 2 kilojoule weld is of weld cross sectional area is very narrow you know weld cross sectional area ah this is narrow but when you use the 5 kilojoule per mm it is very wide okay like this so the first effect of the heat input is your weld cross sectional area gets modified you have to feed a lot of metal to fill up the gap or you have to fuse lot of the metal in uh, to develop such kind of the joint another thing when you apply very limited amount of heat uh, for developing a weld joint say 2 kilojoule then the HAZ is also narrow but when you supply the heat of say 5 kilojoule per mm your weld is large and HAZ is also further larger like this so uh, the weak zone or affected zone you can say the HAZ zone is wider and HAZ zone is the region where the properties have got modified. Properties of the base metal have got modified and they have been altered. It is possible like their mechanical properties are really have been deteriorated, their corrosion resistance deteriorated, their uh, uh, the residual stress and cracking tendency, residual stress and cracking tendency have increased. So all these are undesirable effects. So what we want in welding, you know, it is always good if you can do something using less resources. Same is true here. If we can develop a given weld joint with 0.5 kilojoule per mm heat input, then this is good. This is the best. Rather, if you have to supply a 5 kilojoule uh, per mm heat input. So you have to invest a lot in terms of energy, in terms of that time required in terms of the kind of changes that will be uh, taking place in the metal in, in form of heat effect they don't so it's not good at all to supply more heat therefore in fusion welding efforts are always made to develop the weld joint with the minimum possible heat input uh, that that's what we call is h net net heat input net heat input so this has to be minimum whatever minimum possible so that your joint is sound there is an optimum heat input requirement i'll tell you what is that like say if a joint is to be developed between the two components like this and you supply less than optimum then you may find there is a lack of penetration one true thickness penetration has not been achieved one there are a lot of pores or there is a very high stress concentration so stress concentration force or lack of penetration lack of fusion these are some of the issues which will be due to the when your H net is less than optimum and when it is more than optimum you may find another opposite situation you know weld is very large very wide heat affected zone so all these are not good high or residual stress and distortion tendency a large very wide hz and the large deterioration in properties of the base metal in the heat affected zone as well as in the weld zone uh, in form of like say the coarse coarse uh, grain structure so all these are deteriorating so what i have what i can say here hmm, so if this side you have the heat this is the optimum heat input okay so uh, with so optimum heat input will be giving you the best performance if your heat input is high the performance will keep on decreasing if your heat input is low performance will keep on decreasing so there is an optimal level so we can say the weld characteristics 
or weld performance. So weld performance is maximum for optimum heat input. Thereafter, it will keep on decreasing both the sides. And these are the reasons what I have said here. Higher heat input will be leading to the greater residual stress, wider heat affected zone, coarser grain structure. On the other end, lower heat input will be leading to the lack of fusion, lack of penetration, lot of pores, high stress concentration, etc. And both will be deteriorating the performance of the weld joint. Okay, like this. So optimum. Yeah, you can say here. So there is you can say a little flat zone like this. And so both the sides there is a deterioration and this is the optimum higher and lower okay this one side i'll give another side of the fusion welding so that's why efforts are always made to reduce the heat input what whatever you can do okay another aspect uh okay uh, let me talk before going into the another aspect let me talk little about how can you reduce the heat input okay so uh, there are different uh, fusion welding processes you know? uh, fusion welding is performed using the different types of the heat sources uh, like gas welding uses the combustion of the acetylene and oxygen mixture so but the power density of uh, this heat source is very low like say 10 to the power 2 kilowatt per centimeter square okay power density like how much uh, kilowatt kilowatt uh, per centimeter square 100 kilowatt per centimeter square so roughly like this another heat source like a simple arc welding if you take sealed in metal arc welding process power density say around like say a thousand to ten thousand or uh, say or five thousand uh, of the what you can call as kilowatt per centimeter square if you talk of like say uh, gmaw process anyway so let me talk about this uh, arc welding having thousand to five thousand kilowatt per uh, centimeter square if you talk take the gmaw uh, and gtaw both are uh, like the gas uh, tig welding or mig welding these are more commonly known as mig or tig welding processes so they have got around say 10 to the power 4 uh, kilowatt per centimeter square i'll show you the figure also related to this then you if you take the paw plasma arc welding uh, that may have say 10 to the power 5 kilowatt per centimeter square and if you take the um, laser beam building laser beam 10 to the power 7 kilowatt per centimeter square and electron beam welding has got it further higher 10 to the power 8 kilowatt per centimeter square okay so you can see the different processes offering you the different power densities those you make a range from say 10 power 2 to 10 to the power 8 so these will be different in increasing order like this so uh, uh, the increasing power density means in a very less time over a very small area you are able to deliver the lot of heat a lot of energy so i have got one simple relation so power density if you see here power density so, yeah so mm, if you take a simple plot this side say the power density and this side you have the time for heat delivery so you know you take the base metal like this and you know to melt the dis, uh, given volume of the metal you need because the metal has got a fixed latent heat and a sensible heat isn't it so this uh, uh, may be fixed say for steel it is 2 uh, kilojoule per uh, mm cube something like this 
So uh, the amount of heat required to fuse is fixed and that is a property of the metal. Okay. So if uh, a metal needs a particular amount of the heat for realizing the fusion. Now, how much time you take to supply this much heat, it will depend upon like for, facil for facilitating the fusion of the base metal, this particular amount of heat is needed, fixed heat is needed. But that much amount of heat is supplied in how much time? That depends upon the power density. Power density you are delivering at the rate 100 kilowatt per centimeter square over a, over a larger area lower power density means 100 kilowatt or you are delivering at the rate of 10 to the power 5 kilowatt per unit area. So when you are using the lower power density it will take long time to supply the desired amount of heat to fuse the metal as compared to the case when you are using the high power density. In case of the high power density heat source, you can deliver the desired amount of heat in very less time. Okay. So, given the situation, like for a given amount of heat desired for melting, when you use high power density, high PD process, it takes less time. Right. And when you use the low power density process, you need to use the lot of time, longer time to supply the amount of it. This is one aspect only like low power density welding processes like say gas welding or your shielded metal arc welding. They will be taking long time to realize the fusion state as compared to the laser welding or electron beam welding or plasma welding. This is one aspect. The another interesting and important aspect is Metals have got thermal conductivity, so the heat being supplied will be dissipated to the low temperature underlying metal. Here you have the high temperature in the weld zone, while the base metals are at low temperature, say at room temperature. So 24 degrees centigrade and on the other hand 1500 degrees centigrade. So heat will be dissipated. If you are taking very long to achieve the desired molten state then it, in meantime you will be able to deliver the lot of heat to the base metal and that will be leading to the wider heat affected zone. On the other hand if you are melting it very quickly and, and then moving on further to complete the weld then amount of heat supplied will be very less because you are realizing the molten state very quickly and then your heat source is moving further. So the, the time is not enough for the heat to get dissipated and that is why when you use the high power density heat source, heat source, your net heat desired, net heat desired is low as compared to the case when you use the low power density heat source. When you use the low power density heat source, the net heat input desired is high because lot of heat, it takes longer time and during that time, lot of heat will be dissipated to the base metal. So you need to supply lot of heat. Okay. So we get a relationship. That relationship goes in like this. Oh, sorry. Ah, here. Here. So, um, the net heat input here and power density here of the heat source. So say 100, 10 to the power 4 and 10 to the power 8. Okay. So this is the case of laser beam. Say GTAW and for gas welding. So when you use gas welding, 
GW power density is around 100. So the heat input requirement is high. Heat input requirement goes down when you use the higher power density say 10 to the power 4 say in case of the arc welding processes. And when you use the radiation based processes like uh, uh, laser beam or electron beam uh, then your power density is very high and you need further lower heat inputs. Okay. This is one aspect. The second aspect increasing the heat input means increasing the damage so this side your damage is increasing that we call as a thermal damage to the base metal thermal damage to the base metal means you have got very large weld area you have got very wider heat affected zone you have got much greater compromise with the base metal properties due to the high heat input. So, you, your performance is getting compromised. That is why a heat input directly affects the performance. Or you can say the heat input, uh, lower the heat input, performance is compromised. Higher heat input, performance is compromised. So, in general, we are more concerned about the heat, higher heat input that has to be reduced. So, if the heat input is increased, increasing heat input beyond the optimum level, performance is brought down. We usually take care of the lower heat input side because if there is a lack of penetration, lack of use and lot of porosity, the joint will be discarded in any case. What is the problem with the high heat input? Like you, you get a joint which is solid, which is free from discontinuities, still the joint performance is compromised. So you are not able to actually reject the joint, but despite of uh, the having sound joint, your joint performance is getting compromised because your heat input was too high. So it is more technically important to see the heat input from the uh, com uh, compromise or a deterioration in performance of the joint due to the high heat input. Okay. So, I hope you would have understood what kind of processes would be better for developing a sound joint with the low heat input. So, it is very apparent low heat input, high heat energy, higher the energy density process, lower the net heat, in, low heat lower the net heat input that will be fine. Lower the energy density like arc welding or the gas welding, higher the heat input that you need. So, you need to work with the, the your the joint performance will be poor. Okay. Now, coming to the another aspect. Okay, let's see. All of you know that uh, all the metals even if you leave the metal at uh, room temperature in ambient condition for a long time, then what will happen? Metal will tend to react with the oxygen. Oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen. So these gases tend to interact with and they will be forming their oxides, nitrites, hydrides and these will be present at the surface and if these are not taken care of, these will be there as impurities in the weld. Okay, this is one thing and this was the story of the room temperature. The moment you increase the temperature that to melt up to the melting point, all the metals the, their affinity and reactivity all that increases with the temperature therefore in the molten state molten metal so the metal in the molten state it becomes very active and it immediately tends to 
react with oxygen, nitrogen and hydrogen. This is one thing where chemical reaction is taking place. The second thing, you know, the metals or the liquids, the liquid and solid. So, the liquid metal in the solid state will have the low solubility to the gases. While the solubility to the gases is high in the liquid state. So, the, the moment your metal is brought to the molten state, the solubility to the oxygen, nitrogen and hydrogen increases and in during the fusion welding, if the excess is there of these gases or of atmospheric gases to the molten metal, then these will get dissolved. So, the problem is the, with the fusion welding. The moment molten state is realized during the fusion welding, these gases tend to get dissolved. So, the first thing, the reaction, they are, they are reacting and forming the compounds like oxides, nitrites, hydrides or they are tending to get dissolved. So, these are two ways by which the gases can interact. Okay. So, what is the effect? Say you have got a large well pool, okay. Say there is a large well pool, right. Now you have got all these gases dissolved here in the molten metal, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, etc. Since the well pool solidifies very quickly as compared to that of casting may take like say 100 seconds, 300 seconds, like 5 minutes. But weld may be solidifying even less than one second or two seconds. So, the time available is not enough for these dissolved gases to come out of the weld pool. So, they will get a trapped, entrapment of the gases which have got dissolved in form of oxygen, nitrogen, etc. So, you will get the pores. So, the, this is one problem like the atmospheric gases if they are having access to the weld metal, molten weld metal, then they will get dissolved. These gases will get dissolved and due to the rapid solidification, very high cooling rates, your uh, entrapment of the gases will be taking place and that will be leading to the development of pores that we call as porosity. But uh, if uh, these gases are chemically reacting, you know, if these gases are chemically reacting with the metal and forming their, let us say, metal oxides, like say iron oxide is being formed, magnesium oxide is being formed or iron nitrides is being formed in the weld metal, then these nitrites, oxides, etc. here and there, they will be of the density similar to that of the molten metal. So, they may remain with the molten metal, even may not tend to uh, get up to the surface. So, these compounds in form of oxides, nitrites, if these are left in the weld metal, if these are not able to reach up to the surface, then these will be present as inclusions. Okay. So, to protect the weld metal from the dissolution of these gases, from the formation of these chemical uh, compounds due to the uh, reaction with the molten metal, it is very important that the molten metal is protected from the atmospheric gases. So, what we see, it is important to protect the weld metal from atmospheric gases. Of course, these are oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, etc. So, in fusion welding, what we do, we have to seal to to provide the protection, we need to provide the desired shielding to the weld metal. So, in different processes, you know, there are different approaches which are used for shielding purpose in fusion welding. 
this comes in form of like say this is an arc so in arc what we do the molten metal and uh, around this we form a, a jet or uh, sorry inert gas cover or inactive gas cover depending upon the process so what we do we create a shroud or cover or shield of either inert gas or inactive gas inert gas you know organ and helium inactive gas like carbon dioxide if metal is not reacting with the metal it can be carbon dioxide or you can provide a cover of the molten flux layer molten flux layer so you provide the shielding of the inert gas inactive gas molten flux layer and there is a fourth approach you do the welding in the vacuum so have a vacuum chamber like this take out all the atmospheric gases and here you have the component to be welded and direct the heat source that is used in the electron beam welding we use vacuum so the fourth approach of protecting the molten metal from the atmospheric gases is use of vacuum so that's how there are four approaches of protecting the weld pool or molten met weld metal from the atmospheric gases one is vacuum that is used in electron beam welding and molten flux layer this is used in submerged arc welding and inert gases are used in like mig welding or tig welding in both and inactive gases are used in like uh, your uh, simple shielded metal arc welding okay or your flux code arc welding fcaw so these are the processes where the different approaches are used now the point here is since the approach uh, the different welding processes use different approach for protecting the weld pool so now talk about the welding process take any welding process it will have its own power density number one and it will have its own protection approach protection approach so power densities are different protection approaches are different so they will be using the different net heat input and they will be providing the different cleanliness of the weld means the different oxygen and nitrogen content in the weld so the one which is which provides the cleanest to weld with the minimum heat will be giving the best performance okay so the point here is if the weld is being made using the minimum possible heat okay and it is clean there is no pore there is no inclusion and the weld is clean it will give you the best performance on the other hand if your weld is uh, being developed using low power density processes leading to the high heat input leading to the very large weld size very large HAZ and with coupled with a lot of uh, oxides and nitrites here and there due to the poor shielding approach then you will be getting the poor performance so that's why now you can easily relate with relate the performance of the weld being made by the different processes now i'll talk about like say smaw your power density say around 1000 okay and your uh, uh, the shielding approach is what inactive gas shroud that is the inactive gas shroud is being used uh, through the thermal decomposition of the flux on the other hand your uh, mig and TIG processes they have got around say 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 5 and you are using inert gas here so protection is far better in case of submerged arc welding you see again it is around say uh, 1000 to 5000 or so say 5000 and uh, the molten flux layer is being used as a pro to for protecting the weld on the other end laser beam welding 
or electron beam welding what you are having in electron beam it is 10 to the power 8 and vacuum that's best laser beam 10 to the power 7 or so and there is an inert gas that's what normally we use or it can be used as co2 also it can be used depending on the metal sensitivity so the, the point here is the different power densities and different protection approaches so the one which results the process which results in the lower heat input number one and better protection to the weld that will be leading to the good weld joint if there is a compromise in terms of protection if there is more heat input then certainly there will be the issues and their, the performance of the weld joint will be reduced okay so i think that's what uh, i wanted to tell as far as this uh, these fundamentals are concerned now hopefully you will be able to uh, relate all these things with the uh, performance of joint when we will be talking about a particular uh, process okay? and this is in order of increasing power density from say uh, gas welding to the laser and electron beam welding okay and this is the power density and the time relationship high power density less time for this achieving the desired fusion so heat input is equal to the energy density of power density multiplied by the time low power density longer time so the greater heat input which is needed uh, heat input to the workpiece it is low when the low power density like in gas welding heat input is more and when the power density is high heat input is low so okay someone has done this problem 